The reconstruction of the South got off to a good start. The passage of the 13th Amendment in late 1865 made slavery permanently unconstitutional. The Freedmen's Bureau, begun back under Abraham Lincoln, now distributed food, clothing, and shelter to black people all across the South. And it helped open schools for former slaves. But unlike Lincoln, the new president, Andrew Johnson, wasn't interested in former slaves. He was a Southerner and a Democrat and had been a slave owner himself. In February 1866, he vetoed an expansion of the Freedmen's Bureau and then looked the other way as Southern leaders instituted new black codes that restricted the freedom of black people. At the same time, he called for the welcoming of white Southern leaders back into the national government. This is a country for white men. And by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. I cannot take the position that a state which attempted to secede is out of the Union. I shall be in favor of the states resuming their former relations to the government in all respects. President Andrew Johnson basically gave the white South a free hand in organizing new government. Didn't give blacks any rights and said, okay, southern whites can form new governments. And these new governments passed these black codes to regulate the freedom of the former slaves. And basically they tried to put them in a condition as close to slavery as possible, using the law to force blacks to go back to work on the plantations. They didn't have civil rights, they couldn't go to court, they couldn't testify, they couldn't vote. The black codes try to make the status of the former slaves that of dependent plantation laborers under the control of the white population. Encouraged by President Johnson's strong support, Southern whites began reinstating many of their old leaders, electing former high-ranking Confederate officers to the U.S. House and Senate. An outraged Congress, where Republicans outnumbered Democrats by almost four to one, refused to seat them. Instead, they passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, effectively nullifying the black codes. On March 27th, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill. I am right. I know I am right. And I am damned if I do not adhere to it. The only way a vetoed bill can become a law is if two-thirds of Congress overrides the veto. In April 1866, two-thirds did. It was the first time in American history that an important piece of legislation was passed over a president's veto. Carl Schurz was a Republican activist. The first gun of the war between the president and Congress was fired. It declared that the reconstruction of the late rebel states was the business not of the president alone, but of Congress. The Republicans in Congress who opposed President Johnson were led by Thaddeus Stevens. Stevens believed that the southern states should not be admitted back into the Union until blacks were given the vote, land, and guarantees of equality under the law. And he called for a total restructuring of southern society. The foundation of their institutions must be broken and relayed, or all our blood and treasure has been spent in vain. In 1866, Congress wrote the 14th Amendment. It was the most important change made to the Constitution since the Bill of Rights, and it said that the states must provide equal protection under the law to all their citizens. No government can be free that does not allow all its citizens to participate in the formation and execution of her laws. Every other government is a despotism. In 1867, Congress took charge of Reconstruction, removing it from President Johnson's hands. It forcibly divided the South into military districts, then passed a sweeping reform bill. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 required each Southern state to write a new state constitution that reflected the amended U.S. Constitution. And it said that while many former Confederate leaders could not vote, all black men could. The act was widely embraced, as Harper's Weekly reported. Though the president sees in it the destruction of the Constitution and the end of civil liberty, the loyal American people see in it the salvation of the Constitution 
and the beginning of civil liberty. That is the meaning of the Reconstruction Act. For the first time in American history, blacks were now elected to political office. 16 African Americans were elected to Congress, representing almost every state of the former Confederacy. And in Mississippi, Hiram Revels became one of two black U.S. Senators, taking the seat of the former Confederate President, Jefferson Davis. The day he was sworn in, the Senate galleries were packed, as a Philadelphia newspaper noted. Never since the birth of the Republic has such an audience been assembled under one single roof. It embraces the greatest and the least American citizens. As Hiram Revels walked down the aisle, everyone stood. Then slowly but steadily, people began to cheer. President Johnson was furious at Congress for boxing him in and taking away much of his power. By now, his opponents were calling him the dead dog of the White House. Within a period of less than a year, Congress has attempted to strip the executive department of its essential power. I have been abused. I have been slandered. I have been maligned. Johnson especially opposed Congress's Reconstruction Act, as Charles Nordoff of the Evening Post sarcastically editorialized. He expressed the most bitter hatred of the measure in all its parts, declaring that the white people of the South, poor, quiet, unoffending, harmless, were to be trodden underfoot to protect a pig-headed man with only one idea, a bitter opposition to universal suffrage. In 1867, disgusted with Johnson's attitudes, the Republicans in Congress decided to get rid of him. For two months, the House of Representatives debated. Finally, House members voted to impeach Andrew Johnson. Impeachment of me for violating the Constitution? Damn them! Have I not been struggling ever since I have been in this chair to uphold the Constitution, which they trample underfoot? Now the matter went to the Senate. Only they could try a president. Thaddeus Stevens was one of those who presented Congress's case. I accuse him in the name of the House of Representatives of having perpetrated a foul offense against his country. He has sought to convert a land of freedom into a land of slaves. This people have put the chief of traitors on trial and now demand judgment of his misconduct. If President Johnson were convicted of high crimes and misdemeanors, he would be thrown out of office. On Saturday, May 16th, the vote began. As expected, all the Democrats voted not guilty. Republican after Republican voted guilty. But behind the scenes, Johnson had been making deals with several Republican senators in return for the promise not to vote for impeachment. The final tally was 35 to 19, just one vote short of the total needed for conviction. President Johnson would remain in office. In 1869, the year after Andrew Johnson's acquittal, Congress passed the 15th Amendment it gave black men the right to vote all across the country. In the South, social reforms were now spreading quickly. Black children were enrolling in 4,000 new public schools across the South. At least nine black colleges were opened. State legislatures were being integrated. It was a civil rights revolution, and it was forced on the South by the Republican-controlled Congress as Carl Schurz explained. The Republic emancipated the slaves and promised them freedom forever. The protection of their rights is therefore a matter of duty. This duty will present itself again and again in legislation directly interfering with the southern states. For the southern people, deluded by false hopes, 
are still struggling to restore the old order of things. Furious with the North for interfering in its society, Southern hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan began waging war on former slaves. Lynchings, rare before the Civil War, now became increasingly common. A Southern black man named Ben Johnson witnessed one of the Klan's crimes. It was a cold night when the Ku Kluxes come and drugged the niggers Ed and Cindy out of bed. They carried them down in the woods and whooped them. They throws them in the pond. Cindy ain't been seen since. Black citizens of Frankfort, Kentucky, sent a petition to Congress. We believe you're not familiar with the Ku Klux Klan's riding nightly over the country and in the county towns, spreading terror wherever they go by robbing, whipping, ravishing, and killing our people without provocation. We have been law-abiding citizens, pay our tax, and in many parts of the state, our people have been driven from the polls, refuse the right to vote. In 1869, the Civil War hero, Ulysses S. Grant, became president. Unlike Johnson, Grant cared deeply about American blacks. And with his support over the next years, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 18...